Welcome to our Wednesday edition of Beat Diabetes. This is the one Beat Diabetes video that we make per week that deals with our challenge specifically. Really, any video I make is going to relate to beating diabetes and can be helpful with those who are taking the challenge. But this one, we try to address some of the issues, at least at the beginning we're going to this time. Uh, I wanted to say that, guess what? We're over halfway there. So if you've been faithful, and let me say that's a, uh, that's a big if, if you've been faithful to stay with the guidelines, two meals per day, butter, uh, bulletproof coffee otherwise, or maybe some bone broth, or if you have to, one to two boiled eggs, but just not much of a meal, that third meal. So normally we say skip breakfast, have a lunch, have a dinner within about six hours of your lunch. So 12 to to 6 or 12.30 to 6.30 or 1 to 7. And uh, that's it. No snacking in between those meals. And make sure those meals are low carb. And we've got suggested meals that are sent out by email. So the two meals a day, the time-restricted eating. Every Monday is a carnivore Monday where you eat basically meat and eggs and maybe some cheese if you need to, but mostly meat. So you're, you're, you're doing a carb fast on Mondays. You're not fasting truly. <laughs> you're still eating. You're still getting calories, but you're doing a carb fast by going carnivore. Some people do that seven days a week. And uh, I've never done that that, off, that much, but uh, I do have carnivore meals from time to time. And uh, sometimes a couple of carnivore, carnivore meals in a day. So we're over halfway there. Hopefully you've seen some progress already. And uh, I just believe there's a lot more to come for you. Uh, wanted to mention that on Thanksgiving and Christmas, because they're such big holidays, we're going to lighten the load a little bit, lighten that load, and uh, allow you to have um, a meal uh, for breakfast as well. So those can be three meal days in celebration of those two holidays, Thanksgiving, giving thanks to God for all his goodness to you. And if you're on this challenge and you're seeing victory and progress and improvement, you have a lot to be thankful for, along with so many other things in our lives that we have to be thankful for. And then, of course, Christmas when we celebrate the birth of Jesus. So those two big holidays... Go ahead and have your three meals, but make sure they're low-carb meals. Do I ever cheat? Not much on those days. Uh, last Thanksgiving, I did cheat just a tiny bit. I had a corn on the cob. We bought corn on the cob for my family, our kids that were coming, and I had a corn on the cob. And so uh, I was eager to test my blood sugar. Everything else was pretty much low-carb. There was nothing, and even my dessert, I had a, if I remember right, I had a low-carb pumpkin pie. And uh, I tested my blood sugar, knowing that that corn on the cob wasn't really something I would normally eat, but it was good. So I got by with it. I just may do that again this Thanksgiving. So if you have to cheat, just cheat a little bit. And uh, I do have a, a video Benedict and I made about pumpkin pie, the keto or low-carb way. And by changing the crust, and changing the, the, the dairy product and uh, what's the, oh, changing the sweetener, of course. Uh, you can take that from high carb to, well, if not low carb, somewhat low carb. Probably not the lowest carb dessert, but for a holiday, uh, not a bad switcheroo. And there's just no reason to have a sugary dessert ever. I don't mean... <laughs> I mean, ever. Uh, not on Christmas, not on Thanksgiving. There's just so many keto desserts. If you don't like that one, just type in keto dessert on YouTube or on Google. You will find more keto dessert recipes than you could possibly ever eat in a lifetime. And all you have to do is find a few of them that you really enjoy and then just start making them over and over again. I've been making that keto pumpkin pie for a long time. Uh, years and years and years. I can't even remember when I first started. I would suppose it was in the... Uh, maybe around 2004, five, something like that. And uh, I, I, there's no reason for me to change. It's good. It doesn't jack up my blood sugar much. So anyway, there is some things. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention about the challenge. Some people are still trying to get in on the challenge. They're saying, sign me up or count me in. Can't do it quite the way you want me to. 
because we're no longer taking challenge participants in terms of officially signing you up for the fall 2023 challenge. Uh, <laughs> fall is nearly over, or at least uh, about half over. But there is a simple way to do this, and that is just watch every Wednesday video and go backwards. Find out, you know, you can go to my videos, type, go to my channel, click on the Beat Diabetes channel, and click on the, the videos, and then just start looking at the ones that came out on Wednesdays, and those are the ones that are sent out or are made with the challenges in mind. And also in the description of the Wednesday videos will be a link to the emails that I send out. It's an email, but it's on the web. So all you have to do is click on that, and you can see the email on the web, and you can stay in touch with even the emails I sent. So really, you can still be part of the challenge, even though you're not officially part of the challenge. All right, well, today I want to, um, I want to talk about uh, a video that was on YouTube. So this is essentially a YouTube video about another YouTube video. You say, well, what video would that be? It was an interview Dr. Westman did. Eric Westman, I believe, is his, his first name is Eric. And uh, he did an interview with Dr. Michael and Mary Eads, and that uh, got my attention in a hurry because Mary and Michael Eads, uh, I, I owe them a debt. I found them early on in the, <laughs> with the discovery of this book. I don't even remember where I bought it. I probably got it off Amazon. I don't know. It's been so long ago. It was probably around 2002, 2003, long time ago. And uh, it didn't convert me to low carb because I was already moving that direction, but it certainly confirmed a lot that I was already seeing. And it taught me some things about insulin. So uh, they're really big. They, they were talking about insulin and hyperinsulinemia and the problem with insulin and too much insulin long before <laughs> Dr. Jason Fung ever even thought about it. These guys were the pioneers in this area. And uh, so uh, I got hold of this book. It's a good book. It's well written. It's easy to read. It's it's not uh, difficult, and uh, it makes some powerful points. So anyway, uh, I got hold of that book early on, and it just confirmed. You know, really to really get something locked into your psyche. Number one, you got to have a revelation of it, or an insight, or an aha moment where you say, "Yeah, that's for me." And then number two. You need it confirmed by some further witnesses and some further books or somebody talking to you or whatever. So I had already seen the low carb movement as the way to go, but this was a confirmation for me. This uh, got used tremendously in my life. So I owe them a debt. If you're watching, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Michael and Dr. Mary Eads. They are called Michael and Mary Eads, same last name, because they're married, but they're both medical doctors. So Dr. Westman is a medical doctor. Dr. Michael Eads is a medical doctor. Dr. Mary Eads is a medical doctor. So you got three doctors hobnobbing together in this interview. It was a Zoom interview, and the audio and uh, video quality is not the best, but it's well worth uh, putting up with less than stellar audio and video for what you will gain from it. And uh, I'll leave a description uh, uh, or I'll leave an, a link in the description so you can watch the whole thing. But for right now, I just want to give you my cliff notes, you might say, my <laughs> little notes I, I typed up. I didn't watch even the whole thing. I uh, watched a little over half of it, but uh, I thought it was really interesting and wanted to share just a few thoughts from this interview Dr. Westman interviewing Dr. Michael and Mary Eads. Uh, the first thing, which I didn't know, Michael Eads had struggled with weight most of his life. And when he hit his 30s, around the mid-30s, he really started to pack on the pounds, really gained a lot of weight, and he became desperate. So often, what, what's, the, what's the quote? Necessity is the mother of invention. So often, when we get desperate, whether it's high glucose or tingling toes or blurry vision or whatever the problem is, when we get desperate, we start reaching out and looking, what can work for me? What will fix this problem? And that's what he had. He was obese. He wasn't thinking about diabetes at the time. He was just big and he wanted an answer. 
So uh, as he became obese, he ran across a plan. As I understand it from watching this video, it was a supervised semi-fasting plan. And I, he didn't go into detail about what all the fasting was, whether it was alternate day fasting or uh, eat one meal a day. He, he mentioned that he eventually uh, started promoting a one meal per day OMAD, was what we call it these days, uh, fasting plan. But he doesn't exactly give the, the specifics of what his plan was, but it had to do with fasting and it had to do with eating low carb. Well, you know, when you've got fasting and you've got low carb, you've got a powerful left-right combination to beat obesity and diabetes. So with his fasting and his low carb eating, boom, guess what? Well, you can guess. It worked. And lo and behold, he lost the weight and he got excited and it became something that changed his life. But interestingly, with this particular plan, and it was very well monitored, it cost a lot of money. Uh, he, he did it apparently in connection with some kind of a medical clinic, a, a, a medical program where you paid several thousand dollars and they monitored you all the time and they checked everything about you as you were doing this to make sure you didn't die on them. And, uh, and it worked, as I said, uh, but the, the strange thing that, uh, thing that he found strange was that after it was over, they recommend he go back to a low fat diet. So the, the low carb thing was an intervention you use just to lose some weight and then you go back to low fat. And he thought that was odd because the low carb and the fasting had done so well for him. He was loath to go back to eating any other way. And yet that's what they recommended. It didn't make much sense to him. So after a while, he began encouraging his patients. He's a medical doctor. He had a practice at that time. He's retired now. But in those days, he had a practice and people came to him for all the things people come to doctors for, including obesity. And he started recommending a, a fasting slash low carb diet, pretty much like what we talk about these days, intermittent fasting and eating low carb. And uh, it began to work and people got results. Of course, they would. It has worked in the past. It works now. It'll work a thousand years from now. If a thousand years later, after Dennis Pollock has been dead for nearly a thousand years, somebody runs across this old YouTube video, which probably there won't be a YouTube then, but somebody runs across this video and watches it. A low carb slash intermittent fasting or time restricted eating plan will work for you a thousand years from now, just like it works right now. So anyway, uh, it, it worked. But in those days, and this was back in the 80s, or late 80s and early 90s, uh, everybody was talking about cholesterol. Everybody was worried about cholesterol. And the number one question they would ask him when he says, well, I'll tell you what, I want you to go low carb. Don't be afraid to eat meat. Don't be afraid of fat. Uh, don't be afraid of protein, but keep those carbs really low. And they would all say virtually the same thing. But doctor, what about my cholesterol? Is this not going to drive my cholesterol up into the stratosphere? Uh, am I going to fall over dead of a heart attack? And uh, he didn't know all the details about cholesterol and, and the issues of uh, heart disease and he was still nervous about it because everybody and their cousin was saying saturated fat brings about heart attacks, meat causes heart attacks, causes cancer. It's the worst thing in the world. If you're going to eat meat, don't eat much at all. And whatever you do eat, make sure it is so thin and dry and doesn't have an ounce of fat. And then maybe it'll be okay, but don't eat much and no fat at all. If you've got a fatty steak, take your knife and cut off all the fat. So that's what everybody was saying. Now, that's not what he had done, and that's not really what he was encouraging, but he was nervous <laughs> because there were so many people saying saturated fat causes heart disease. So he recommended it, but he still had a twinge in his conscience of, uh, am I killing these people? You know, what's going on? And then he talks about how that with four specific cases that all happened within a, a short time, apparently a couple of months this issue was resolved for him once and for all. And uh, let me just share uh, two or three of them. One lady came in. She came in for weight. In fact, all these people did. 
Uh, they weren't thinking about insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, diabetes. They were just overweight. But when he took her lipids, he found out that she had triglycerides. Get this, and I didn't know this was even possible. 2,500 triglycerides at a 2,500 level. And it was so ridiculously high. And he'd never heard of anything anywhere close to that. He immediately ordered another test just to make sure it wasn't some kind of a fluke. And sure enough, it came back the same high rate. Ridiculously high triglycerides. But she was young. She was relatively young. I, not, not 18 or 20, but she wasn't even at menopause yet. So I suppose uh, late 30s, maybe early 40s. He felt like she was not really a candidate for a heart attack. So I'll go ahead and I'll recommend eat lots of meat, eat low-carb vegetables, green leafy vegetables, garden salads, and some cheese, and keep your carbs down to almost nothing. She did it, you know, she trusted her doctor and she came back. Let's see how long it was. It was uh, three weeks, came back and he did the full lab work, full blood work again, just to see where had they gone? Probably sort of worrying that that 2,500 level might now be up to 3,500, but instead, get this, triglycerides of 2,500 within three weeks came back in the 100s. They had dropped <laughs> like the proverbial stone and everything else looked good as well. And she had lost weight and she was feeling great. And he's like, wow, <laughs> this stuff really works. What I recommended actually worked for this lady from 2,500 triglycerides down to the 100s. Amazing. Another lady came in with sky high cholesterol, 700 in the 700s. Well, he thought, okay, let's see what happens here. Gave her the same diet, meat, green leafy vegetables, salads, cheese. Stay away from any other carbs. And she came back in a few weeks. And now her cholesterol had normalized and everything looked great. Her lipid panel from being outrageously high in the cholesterol department was now normal. And he's starting to get some confidence. Another person came in, similar results. Finally, he had a man come in who had, he had known was a friend of his. He was 58 years old, middle-aged, and uh, he had high cholesterol, lipid values through the roof. And again, he was still a little bit nervous thinking, uh, I don't want to send this man to his death. So he was like, well, um, I'm going to put you on this special diet. Actually, he put him on the diet, the, the, the steak and meat and salads diet and cheese before he realized what the lipids were because they hadn't come in yet. When they came in, he got nervous. He's like, I've got to call him and tell him, call it off. Don't do it. <laughs> Your cholesterol is too high. But by that time, the man had gone, had left for a cruise. He's like, well, if he's on a cruise, he's probably eating normally anyway. So at least I'm not sending him to his death. When he gets back, we'll see what's going on and I can monitor him more closely. So the man came back in about 11 days, and lo and behold, his cholesterol had normalized, and he told the doctor, I've been following your diet even on the cruise. I just ate meat and seafood and salads and stayed away from all the carbs. I followed your diet to the letter. And when he checked his lipids, fearing that the man was probably ready for death, everything had normalized. So within a matter of a couple of months, bang, 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 four people who were outrageously high in their cholesterol, in their triglycerides, and their lipid panels looked horrible, like they were about ready to fall over dead any moment. And by putting them on a low carb, leafy green vegetable and steak and cheese diet, they all normalized. And after that, he said, I became fearless. I was no longer afraid. He stopped listening to all the fear mongers who said, oh, the cholesterol is going to get you, baby. The cholesterol is going to get you. And he began to uh, recommend it to one and all. And, uh, and eventually he wrote this book, Protein Power, not too long after all that. And it's kind of funny because, you know, when he wrote it, uh, when I got this book and it said Protein Power, power and, and now I realize that almost all keto people emphasize fat more than protein. Protein is kind of like the lower level cousin. 
<laughs> the less valuable cousin. Fat is the big one. And, uh, and I assumed he wrote protein power because in those days, protein was more important. And now fat is considered more important. He tells how that his actual first title, working title, was Insulin Connection. It's really much more about insulin and how it responds to carbohydrates and how that is the mother of all evils metabolically. Uh, and they didn't like it. They said, oh, we can't do insulin connection because everybody's going to think that's only for diabetics. They wanted to market this for people who wanted to lose weight and had all kinds of other issues, not just for diabetics. So even though he pushed for the insulin connection as a title, they wouldn't allow it. I thought that was interesting because I've written three books and every one of those books, they took my title and ran with it. I thought, well, I must have a nicer publisher than he did, but uh, they were probably a lot bigger. Mine was Harvest House and they're relatively big as a Christian publishing company. But anyway, they wouldn't go for that. So he, he put out uh, several sheets of possible potential titles that might work. And the, one of them was a Protein Power. And that's the one they chose. Of course, it's got the alliteration PP, protein power. Uh, and uh, so it became a huge success. Now, he was nervous about that title because he thought everybody's going to say, oh, you're pushing protein. Don't you know that's going to destroy your kidneys? And uh, that's not a healthy thing to, to, to have a high protein diet. The reality was he doesn't really push a high protein diet. He says, well, we push an adequate protein, but that usually means more protein than most people are getting. So instead of saying, be nervous about the meat, be nervous about the saturated fat and just have a little and then cut that in half and just have about a half of that. He's like, eat it freely. But he also eats plenty of fat. And he always tried to avoid, it's kind of funny, Dr. Westman asked him, uh, what about macros and, and the, the fat percentages and so forth. He said, we never wanted to talk about fat percent in terms of what percent of your calories are you getting from fat? Because he said, I knew the way things were in those days in the 1990s, every fat was the demon. Fat was the evil thing, the, the worst of all. And if he even hinted that fat might be okay, it, it could destroy him. So he had to kind of tiptoe around the fat issue. But one time he says, I was giving a talk and uh, somebody a afterwards, I took questions and somebody asked me, well, what about fat? What percent of fat do you eat? And uh, he had never really thought about it because that was never a big deal for him. He just ate protein and fat equally and uh, didn't worry so much about what the percent was. But when he figured it out, he figured out and finally told the guy just because the guy had asked him, there's no getting around it. Uh, about 65 to 70 percent of my diet or my calories come from fat. He said when he said that, there was almost a gasp in the room. Everybody was shocked. 70 percent of your calories are coming from fat? <laughs> Now, Dr. Mary and Michael Eads, uh, and Mary had some things to say too. Let me see if I can, I, I don't want to leave Mary out altogether. Yeah, Mary said this, we both knew saturated fat was okay, but we didn't say it in the book. Wouldn't put it in the book too much uh, because of the times in which that book was written. Now they would be much freer, and I think, and they are freer to talk about it. But uh they're older people by now. I don't know what their age. I was trying to look and see how old they are. I don't know. Uh, I'm guessing maybe early 70s. I don't know. Maybe somebody knows they can leave a comment. They're not teenagers. They're not in their 20s or 30s or 40s. And they've been eating this way and living this way for years. And they still seem healthy and sharp and smart. And they look good. So it hasn't hurt them very much. It's kind of nice when you know there are people around, people like Dr. Eads and his wife, like myself, like Dr. Bernstein, that have been eating low carb, not just for a couple of years, but for a couple of decades and more. And we're still alive and kicking. We didn't fall over of a heart attack. I mean, that's the word on the street, right? That's the word among the high fat group, or excuse me, the low fat group the ones that want you to eat whole foods, plant-based, low, low, low fat. And the word is, if you eat saturated fat, it'll kill you. 
It'll kill you. It might not get you today, but look out for tomorrow. And we've got all these people, including Dr. Bernstein, who's kind of the champion of all of us, who's been eating this way for 35 or more years. I don't even know, but probably 40 years or more. And he's 80, what, 88 now or 89? And still going and still has a medical practice. <laughs> and he's got lots of energy. So, the, you know, a lot of people, they have to admit that low carb and uh, high fat works. It works in the sense that you'll lose weight on it. It works in the sense that you will lower your A1C, you'll lower your fasting blood sugar, you'll become more insulin sensitive. It just flat works. The only thing they can say in rebuttal, and for some reason they feel they have to rebut it somehow and, and criticize it some way. They can't say it doesn't work. They can't say it doesn't lower glucose. They can't say it doesn't lower A1C. They can't say it doesn't help you lose weight. It does all of those things. The one thing they have left is, well, yeah, but it'll get you eventually. You just wait, my friend. You just wait. You'll be walking through the aisles of Walmart and bam, you'll fall over dead. And people will gather around you and say, my, 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 he ate way too much fat. Look at him. I can just tell by seeing him lying there dead on the Walmart floor. He ate too much fat. Well, that's, of course, nonsense. And there's a number of us that have been eating this way for some time. So far, we're doing well. No, it's not a guarantee. Our bodies are complicated. Life is complicated. And I could be gone before this year is out. But uh, it increases my odds of living long and staying healthy. That much I know. I know that the dentist of today is much healthier than if I could go back in a time, my, a time machine and talk to the dentist of 2001, where I first started having blood sugar problems, and say, just keep eating like you're doing, Dennis. Just keep eating all that sugar, all those carbs. Just keep doing it. I can't say how long I'll live, but I'll tell you what, I'm doing a lot better. I'm convinced. I'm 100% convinced I'm doing a lot better by the changes I made. And I suspect that if I didn't make those changes, I'd either be dead or a full-blown over-the-top raging diabetic with an A1C in the 11, 12, 13, if I'm still around at all. So I'm happy that the dentist of 2001, 2002 made some major changes. And you can too, my friend. This is not just for guys that write books and have YouTube videos. This is for ordinary guys. This is for truckers. This is for school teachers. This is for Walmart employees. This is for guys that work in the oil fields. Whatever you do, this is for you. It will work for you. You don't have to be special. You don't have to have a YouTube channel. You don't have to be a medical doctor. Cut those carbs. Do some time-restricted eating and watch things improve.